Hi, welcome to another episode of Positivity with Paul. I'm Paul Candola, and I find fellow actuaries, pun intended, for a conversational Q&A in their life. The focus is on their journey along the actuarial exam path and beyond, some of the challenges they faced, and how those challenges helped them shape them become who they are today. To give some brief context on becoming an actuary, there's a number of actuarial exams that one has to go through. These exams are very rigorous, and typically only the top 40% pass at each sitting. They cover complex mathematical topics like statistics and financial modeling, along with insurance, investments, regulatory, and accounting. Candidates can study up to five months per sitting, and usually it takes around seven to 10 years on average to earn their fellowship degree. To that end, I launched this series of podcasts because I was curious about what drove my guests to surmount trials and tribulations to get to that end goal of becoming an actuary. My guest in this interview is Mary Pat Campbell. Mary Pat is an actuary working in Connecticut, investigating life insurance and annuity trends. She's been interested in exploring mortality trends, public finance, and public pensions as an advocation. Some of these explorations can be found in her blog, stump.marypat.org. Mary Pat is a fellow of the Society of Actuaries and a member of the American Academy of Actuaries. She's been working in the life and annuity industry since 2003. She holds a master's degree in math from New York University and an undergraduate degree in math and physics from North Carolina State University. In this podcast, Mary Pat discusses similarities and concepts between physics and actuarial science, the current low rates environment, and lessons learned in the insurance sector from the financial crisis in 2008 and 2009. Hope you enjoy this all-inclusive interview. Thanks for uh, coming on the show, Mary Pat. Thanks, Paul, <laughs> for having me. Awesome. So, um, uh, yeah, Mary, uh, you taught uh, exam EFE. Uh, that was a while ago. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> and Lee, I wanted to uh, start from the, the beginning of uh, your actuarial journey. And okay. uh, uh, as far uh, as um, kind of the the building blocks of how you got to uh, know about actuarial science at first and uh, okay. which was that career path. So um, the way I learned about actuarial science in terms of that it existed, uh, it was just kind of on the edge of my awareness. When I was an undergraduate, I was a math and physics uh, major in undergraduate school. And where I went, which was North Carolina State University, they had, it was kind of funny, they had a couple of, I don't call them ex-actuaries, they were still credentialed, uh, but who were professors in the department. And there was, you know, various probability related courses that helped you with a few, just a couple, not all the actuarial exams that existed, not even all of the preliminary actuarial exams that existed at the time, but some of them. Um, and it, it was funny because I didn't realize until years later that one of the graduate level classes I took on probabilistic modeling was with an FCAS. Uh, I found that out years later. Um, but I had heard that, you know, they had, you, they had posters and that, and that kind of thing. So fine, but I went to math grad school and fast forward several years. <laughs> Um, when I realized the academic and staying in math was not going to work out for me, um, that was around 2002 and I was thinking, um, hmm, okay, what can I do instead? And so I did actually start looking around, uh, for a variety of things. I kind of remembered being an actuary uh, as something that people with an applied math background could do. Um, and so I looked up, you know, I found the SOA's website at the time, which looked a, looked a lot different than it does now. <laughs> um, and I saw what the exams were and I'm like, oh, okay, well, probability I, in calculus, I can do that. Um, actually, that was exam, that was course one back then. Um, I taught those subjects for years. And then uh, course two covered microeconomics, macroeconomics, um, uh, interest theory, and you know the the really basic non life contingency exam. And so actually, I signed up for the two exams to take at one time um, because I didn't have to study for course one, but I did have to study for course two. Um, and I did did pretty well on those. I sent out resumes, and I got a call back from one company 
they interviewed me. They gave me a job offer. So I started in spring 2003 as an actuarial student at that time. Um, and that was with TIA CREF at the time. It's now TIAA. Uh, but yeah, all it takes is one callback, one interview, one job <laughs> offer to get your foot in the door and, you know, go from there. Actually, around that time, I think there's a huge overhaul in um, the actual actuarial exams. They went from one, two, three, four to. The that three. was, yeah. So I actually managed to stay right ahead of all of those changes that. That change became complete, I believe, in 2007, um, and that's when I got my FSA. <laughs> so um, I, I did have to take one of the exams in the change. So I had all of the old, so the numbered ones, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then eight V, which was investments. Um, but then I kind of missed out. There was one thing that was called, I think it was PD, uh, which was like a little project you had to do and get credit hours as it were but i really didn't have enough time to finish it but uh to get to the fsa i just need i just needed one more exam which was apmv which was again i figured it was just like taking 8v and it was almost like that um and so i took another exam passed that and then uh, fsa in 2007 so uh wow that's fast it wasn't too bad. I'm not sure if it's fast for now. I've seen some statistics uh, given some of the changes that have been made with the exams and, and starting to end in five, six years, I think is not that unusual now, um, but I could be wrong. So that right. recently. yeah. Yeah, in, in terms of, uh, I was interested like that five year at that point is harder to do. I, I feel like rather than now where the exams are done quarterly, you know, you have uh, oh, the yeah. changes for universities that we'll get into in a bit. Uh, yeah. uh, but I was interested in did physics actually, did you find anything analogous in actuarial world compared to physics that that uh, uh, some material? That, I mean, that's, that, actually, that's a good question um, because what physics really helped me with because of some of the things that wasn't classwork per se, but I got to, um, I got an RA uh, research assistant position as an undergraduate uh, doing physics, actually my only peer reviewed publication. And I mean, and this was with the professors and other people I was working with. It's like four authors on the paper. It's a physics paper. And it was basically, we did computational modeling of carbon nanotubes are also called Bucky tubes. And I, I was doing it in C, the programming language C. So a lot of numerical computing. Um, now the kinds of dynamics that are involved, the specific dynamics that are involved uh, does not translate to anything in actuarial anything, PNC or life or health. It, it's not related at all, but the numerical computing and having to document all your parameters. And this was the important part, doing estimations. So uh, you have, um, sorry, partial differential equations. I don't wanna use the initialisms. Partial differential equations in multiple dimensions. And it's very complicated. If we tried to do the numerical integration on it, it'd take forever. Uh, so there were, there were simplifications of especially since you're doing it as an ensemble and this kind of modeling efficiency technique just knowing that maybe there's a way you can do a simplification of the problem um, has come up in modeling variable annuities and things like that um, so it's not a direct transfer but uh, a lot of the basic core skills uh, are the same so i mean think of all the physicists who went into um basically computational finance <laughs> you know and the black shoals and all of that kind of thing it's not the same kind of uh, pdes that you're doing in physics that said a lot of the numerical computation skills you have really do transfer from physics uh to finance it, more broadly right um yeah that's interesting um especially with variable annuities there are uh yeah. I'm assuming a lot of it is human uh, judgment, like when, uh, you know, how, how, how does that get modeled is the first question. Uh, com 
compared that's, to... Uh, I mean, that's why actuarial is di more difficult than physics. We don't have to worry about the electrons deciding how strong their electrical charge will be, as opposed to like a variable annuity holder, how much of a withdrawal you will take, you know, that <laughs> kind of thing. Um, yeah, you don't have to worry about that with electrons. <laughs> yeah, that's true. It's more of a pure uh, physics and... Yeah, uh... the, the, yeah I was going to say for physics, the the models, building the models are the easy part. Having something you can actually compute is more difficult um, in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, so yeah, it, it's more of trying to figure out how do you get a, a, a solution or something like a solution that you can depend on. Because I'll, I'll just go back to the carbon nanotubes. We were getting some really weird results uh, from that, that we're saying that these, this material was going to be super strong. And the thing is, we didn't have any real samples of what we were trying to model. That's why we were doing it in a computer uh, to test it. At the time, they didn't know how to manufacture them. They do now, and uh, our modeling was born out. That was pretty cool. Well, I found out about that years later, obviously, but I'm just like, oh, okay, that's cool. Um, <laughs> But that, I mean, that's one of the, the challenges in modeling um, complex systems. You make simplifications, you're like, well, is that valid? Or have I lost some of the dynamics? I mean, and that, that goes for variable annuities too. One of the biggest things, and this is one thing I did for TIA while I was there, was I kind of tested the parameter space on policyholder behavior with certain variable annuities. And I realized that um, the annuities were much, much more sensitive to just the partial withdrawal um, as a uh, you know, model than to our mortality assumption, to all sorts of assumptions. I mean, that was like the biggest thing. Um, and that kind of makes you go like, are we missing something with policyholder behavior dynamics when we have some kind of formula that says, okay, if it's this in the money, this person is gonna withdraw. If they're right. that sensitive, did we simplify it too much? You know, yeah. So right. yeah, it's a um, challenge. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It seems like it's so like overcomplicated at times, and just to get like <laughs> low hanging fruit basics to build off of makes. Well, and when and so when they were doing the regulatory change in the U.S. on valuation of variable annuities, um, the regulators pointed out the actuaries were very very good at. Uh, justifying the mortality assumptions. Okay, great. You know, very detailed experience studies, all this. But for the policyholder behavior assumptions, there was not much support, um, <laughs> which did not surprise me. I mean, there wasn't enough experience data. And if you start showing stress scenarios, um, you will really see how sensitive your models are to that kind of thing. So um, both sides had a point. Right. And the reason why there's not enough experience data is because uh, variable annuities haven't been in the market relatively that well, long? Well, yeah, I mean, variable annuities have been around for a while, but the, the issue is the special living benefits. So variable annuities with various, even just accumulation benefits or um, minimum death benefits, those have been around for a while. That wasn't the issue. It's, it's where you have like guaranteed minimum withdrawals or um, income benefits. Uh, so there, there wasn't enough experience for that kind of product. A lot of them had only been around for a few years by the time the regulators really started looking at them. Um, and those are difficult to hedge. Those are difficult to model because they are so driven. Um, now, I do know of one company that does experience studies for VAs. Um, now, uh, Rourke, um, and, and they put out a report every year now, uh, but it's taken time for them to build up. Uh, and and the other issue, of course, is we had a long bull run from like 2010, 2011 up until relatively recently. Uh, so <laughs> that makes it difficult to test in the moneyness and, and some other things. And that's the problem is like, you might do stochastic scenarios going forward, but you only have one history going backwards. So, you know. Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting too, especially given the real uh, negative interest rates, given inflation. Um, yeah. 
like and think about real negative interest rates wait until we have nominal negative interest rates <laughs> okay. uh, i mean and that's controversial too i i had done some work with uh the academy with regards to their old interest um their economic scenario generator that's the excel one um the soa supports that now and we had been talking we actually first ran into trouble when um our short rate started behaving erratically because we built the model originally in a time when the short rate wasn't below 25 basis points. Um, so, <laughs> so we had to fix that, but the way the model works, uh, it won't really allow negative interest rates. And so you would actually have to change the form of the model. I mean, I'm exaggerating a little bit in terms <laughs> of what, what would have to be done. Um, and in any case, it sounds like the NAAC is going in a different direction with regards to ESGs anyway. Um, but, you know, that was that was interesting. Um, it started out like way, way back, 20 years back, um, that they had it fixed of the 20 year rate, US Treasury rate target was like 6.35%. It was just hard coded. <laughs> Yeah, so that got changed um, and a, a lot of things got changed. So, yeah, it was, it's kind of interesting, you know, working on one of these projects that lasts over a decade, you know. Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. Move, yeah. Now that we're, we're fellows, I kind of yeah. wanted to uh, come across the first time you failed an exam. You know, how did you... Oh. Uh, well, yeah. I did fail. I did fail an exam. I mean, there are those mythical. I actually do know people who never failed an exam. That was not me. Um, so for the preliminaries, I had had no trouble at all. But it's when I got to the written exams that I ran into trouble. Um, and and I think that's a lot of people have that issue because the preliminaries, even with the various changes they've had over a year, they, they tend to be very math centric. And, um, you know, the math itself is really not that difficult, um, not compared to like what I did in math. It, it is kind of on a par with the kind of math I did in physics, but even there, like I had to deal with sine and cosine when I did quantum, you know, or <laughs> electromagnetism, and we don't even have to deal with that. It's just exponentials and polynomials. That's easy. Um, so that wasn't so bad, but when I got I did course six, which was an investment related one. Um, and I did actually pretty well on that because when I was in graduate school, I had done, I had been looking at for my area for my thesis of mathematical finance, but I didn't go that direction. I went the uh, modeling neurons direction uh, in grad school. Um, but so I knew a lot about interest rate derivatives and, and black holes already. So that was easy. Course six, not so bad. Then I hit course five. Course five is basically what the uh, modules, the ASA modules uh, replaced. And um, that was tough because it was basically, okay, here's everything. <laughs> yeah, I mean, these are all the actuarial fields. So pension, I mean, even PNC with claims triangles and all of that. Now, again, the math part wasn't difficult. It was that, okay, so here's the, the rules and regulations for Canadian Medicare. I, I didn't, know, didn't know anything about that. Uh, disability insurance in Canada versus US. Like I wasn't working in those areas. I didn't know anything about the products or any of that. Um, and I wasn't really into doing the note card memorization thing at that point. Right. <laughs> failed the exam. Because you have to, I mean, there is no way you can reason from first principles. What are the rules of Canadian Medicare? Or yeah. Medicaid? Yeah. It's or rules, whatever. right? Yeah. Well, it, it had to do with coverage and all sorts of things. Like what is covered, what isn't covered, um, uh, provincial plans and some other stuff. And I'm like, uh, I don't know. Um, so a lot of the regulations and that kind of thing, and I really, really hated studying about the regulations. So, okay, I failed. And that's when those exams were given once a year, okay? Uh -huh. And that was, I mean, yes, it's great. Actually, the biggest thing I think the SOA did, it wasn't just the preliminary exams multiple times a year. It was the upper level exams twice a year 
was such, I mean, for me, um, I, I needed the year, I'm sorry, I did need the year to get prepared for it again, because while I was taking exams, I had three kids. Um, my daughter, uh, Siobhan, was born spring 2005, and then I took course five again in fall of 2005. So because I knew I needed to memorize, I did do the cards. I did get, um, I think I bought two different study manuals for it too, okay? Um, and I started a lot earlier on the studying um, because the way I study, especially for the FSA exams, the upper level exams, but even for the preliminaries, um, every day, study every day, uh, at least an hour. Um, and, and that's because you can't cram, you can't cram these exams. There's too much in them to cram. You're not going to be able to remember all of it. And that was, you know, that was the big, and then changing from going for math, which was easy. I just did problems. That's fine. But to study for the written exams, you can't do problems. There's not enough example problems to do to begin with, but also they can basically ask anything. Um, for the, for the preliminary, there, they were pretty limited on the kinds of questions they could ask computationally. Um, but for the upper level exams, the written exams, it could be anything. So you actually have to learn the material. You have to memorize the stuff that is, you know, this is the, this is the age of eligibility. This is the number of work units you need to have, you know, all of that, um, right. that, that sort of thing. And what's so funny is, and, and I did pass the second time I took it. Um, and then I threw all my cards out. Um, the, the, the thing about that exam, even though I hated that, I'm actually the, kind of the back office regulatory expert now in my group with regards to stuff like RBC, principal space reserving, and, and that kind of thing. I love uh, thinking about the regulations now, um, but that's because it's for the specific products I'm looking at and some other things. So. It's more of the kind of regulation. I'm, I've always been interested in RBC and solvency measures and, and valuation. I always found that very interesting, especially for like the, the variable annuities. You know, when you have a lot of different embedded options into a product, you know, I like thinking about that. Um, don't like thinking about Medicare from any country. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one, of, one of the things is that after you finish the exams, learning doesn't stop. Things change. I mean, so I mentioned regulations. Well, part of the interest is there's been a lot of regulatory change over the past decade, um, particularly in response to the financial crisis in 2008, um, that a lot of things came out of that that's affected insurance regulations and financial regulations overall. So you have to keep up with that. Um, and so I, I think a lot of what the self study with the exam system, especially with the upper level exams, it, it does kind of prepare you for this is going to be your professional life that you're going to have to read from disparate materials, go to sessions, you know, listen to webcasts and this that and the other to try to learn about the new re regulations that are out there or other things you need to know to be able to get your job done. It doesn't stay still. Um, so, you know, that's kind of interesting. And, 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 you know, the syllabus keeps changing. Right. Uh, the exams keep changing, um, at definitely at the upper level. Um, and the SOA, you know, has, has been putting other stuff out, they adding predictive analytics and some other things. So that's, it's kind of interesting watching that happen. Right. And it was interesting, uh, but, um, uh, you brought it up in the last podcast I was watching where, uh, previously, you know, um, uh, maybe in the 80s and 90s, a lot of things were hard coded in, and uh, yeah. you know there were tables used, and Excel came in oh. and to learn that with VBA. Oh, I've actually got a great story about that because corporate tax rates were that flat 35 percent for so long. A lot of the that was coded in so many in valuation, in spreadsheets, all sorts of things that 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 35 percent was there, and now you had to change it because the federal tax law changed. That was amazing. And the NEAC itself had to scramble to change RBC formulas and stuff because that's an after-tax measure for life insurers. And um, so they had to change all the factors and uh, it was, 
they they did manage it, but it took a lot of work. I know. Um, <laughs> I think it's funny. You assume, like, for example, you assume there's 12 months in a year. We're not having to worry about that. Okay. Hard coding 12, that's fine. But hard coding a tax rate, just no, don't do that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Even if it's been that tax rate for 50 years, I don't care. You can't hard code a tax rate. So. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that just seems like you're asking for for trouble, right? Uh, that 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 that's uh, not set well, in stone. Well, I mean, change, it's right? it saved time back in the '80s. I mean, and think of the whole year 2000 thing. Um, they memory was at a premium. Why, you know, why save one in nine? It's going to be one in nine for every year you're going to put in there. We actually have this problem in some actuarial systems. You can't do it on a spreadsheet. Because um, the the time and date uh, functions in Excel have certain starting points. Actually, and it wasn't you; it was somebody else, I think, who had sent me a spreadsheet with a date that kept changing because it depended on whether you were in the Mac version of Excel or the Windows version of Excel. Because they had a different start date, so the the time zero or the time one was a particular date, and it differed. Um, like one was 1904 and the other one was 1900. Um, yeah. And so oh, wow. if you assume certain things, it was very weird um, of, of you, you might have birth dates and we don't have to worry about that right now. But if you have old policyholder files that you're having to do and you have old policyholders that were born in the 1800s, you have to be able to um, process those dates. Uh, so, you know, that that was kind of interesting. We did this too at TIA. Um, you would have computer systems that the Omega was like hard coded at 120. But when we were doing projections, very long term projections, we we're like, you know, we're having some non zero probability mass, a bunch of people at age 120. Um, maybe we need to be flexible, you know, in the system. Um, like, right. we don't anticipate these things, you just assume. I used That's to. It. Yeah, I'm sorry. This is really going off on a tangent, but I used to scare the people at TIA pointing out various longevity research projects, trying to push out um, the maximum lifespan to like a thousand years. And <laughs> TIA has a lot of income annuities, people actually taking income on annuities. So that's a great way to scare an annuity uh, actuary. <laughs> you're, literally, you're immortal. Like, uh, yeah. you're not gonna. <laughs> um, the, the, no, that's it. Yeah, it's good to stress test. That's right? the New York. I'm sorry. That's the New York State motto. It's really the lottery's motto. But it's like you never know. Um, <laughs> you assume this is the limit, and then you find out like, oh, you know, think about negative interest rates. We assume that interest rates. First off, we assume interest rates couldn't go below 25 basis points. Then we're like, okay, zero. Zero is the lowest it can go. And then we're looking at Bank of Japan. And the the European Central Bank, you're like, hey guys, what are you what are you guys doing? What is this negative interest rate thing? We don't <laughs> understand. Um, yeah. yeah, I've talked with various people. Like, how are you guys handling this stuff? And and some are ignoring it, and some are really trying to figure out. Okay, this is how we're going to model negative interest rates. And, right. Uh and uh, one of the, the 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 material it was a lot of based on the crash in 2008 2009 with uh, uh mortgage backed securities and and CDOs how has that changed uh for the last 10 years is that uh obviously that's more regulated uh but... yeah what's what's interesting so one of the things and I, I i didn't mention so i work at conning in hartford connecticut and um they are primarily an asset management firm uh that said, I'm in the insurance research department, and one of the things I do is um, an analysis of the general account investments of life insurers in the United States. And a lot of insurers had been holding structured products in that run up before the financial crisis. And the reason why they were holding like the triple A tranches or the double A tranches of those, because these had that very high credit rating and it had a spread above treasuries that was very attractive. Um, and that helped them actually increase their portfolio rates while the interest rate levels in general were still falling. Um, so that's what made it very uh, attractive to institutional investors like insurers, at least you know the, the high credit rate um, tranches. Um, 
and you know other institutional uh, players got involved. But in after the crash, a lot of insurers just got out of that asset class entirely. Um, but many stayed and held. And so even though the credit rating went down, and so that did stress their RBC ratios, for instance, um, a lot of those structured products, you actually got, if you're holding till maturity, um, a lot of them did make their yield. Um, it's just that you had to be able to weather that strain on your surplus in, in between. Um, that said, what has happened is a lot of insurers have switched to commercial mortgages outright, as opposed to, hold, or holding more in commercial mortgages, and not so much in RMBS or CMBS. So that's the residential mortgage-backed securities and commercial mortgage-backed securities. Um, yeah, there's been, and, and there's been, the other thing is what a lot of insurers have been doing is they've been buying more just regular old vanilla corporate bonds, but lower credit quality um, to get their spread, not junk, um, but like triple B rated um, and some lower uh, investment grade bonds. Um, and again, to try to get a little bit of the spread over treasuries, but it's very, it's very difficult, you know? Um, yeah, the, the, the low, low interest rate environment is, is, challenging all insurers. So you are a, a, a marker for the uh, SOS oh, yeah. well. <laughs> an exam. Right. Marker. So. Yeah. So yes, I took exams. And then um, after I finished taking exams, I uh, joined the ERM exam committee. Um, and I've been a grader. I've, I've written questions in the past um, and I've been a grader. Uh, we grade uh, virtually now. Um, I don't know if we're going to, I'm, I'm not sure we're going to keep doing that, but obviously over the last year, that's what we've done. And it's, it's worked pretty smoothly. I recommend everybody who goes through the process once you're done at least once. And if you don't know who to contact the SOA, I can totally set anybody up and they all know me. Um, so, <laughs> but also they, they, they always are looking for volunteers. Um, so I highly recommend even grading the last exam you took, you know, right. is just turn right back around and grade the one you just sat for um, the next sitting. Uh, and then you will get an idea of what's involved in the grading. Obviously, I can't tell you all of that, but it made me feel so much better uh, because it's such a mystery, obviously, to candidates while they're going through the exams. They're not trying to make it too much of a mystery. Um, but the amount of preparation and the amount of review that goes into the exam process on, on the SOA side is a lot. Um, and once we finish, I mean, there's a lot of analysis of what the results were. So it's, it's kind of a continuous improvement loop. Um, and, uh, you know, they've got a really good system. They had to do that. They had to make a change, uh, not because of quality, but when they went from once a year to twice a year, uh, they really had to organize to make sure that everything was coming in on time and that, you know, that they're checking the problems, regularizing the um, wording that's used on the problems. Uh, so that like, so when they'll say justify your answer or explain or make a recommendation, that kind of thing. So there's, there's kind of a whole level system. That's kind of those cognitive levels um, and aiming for certain levels covered like they don't want it to be pure memorization they want it to be okay do you can you show how to apply that knowledge and so that's why they like doing case studies and stuff like that right. um so it, it's a big difference when you go from just doing math calculations essentially to okay now you've got a real company situation how do you make this decision or how do you value this product or you know whatever it is Right. Um, or make, make a recommendation to mitigate a, a, a sp specified risk, you know, that kind of thing. Right. Um, and uh, obviously, uh, it's testing your knowledge within the theory of the, the, the syllabus that's given uh, yeah. every everything that's that's part of the syllabus. Yeah. Right. And and I've mentioned this when I when I taught exam seminars before, I would tell people now you've got to realize this is a very restricted. It's a good syllabus. But you have to realize there's a lot of stuff outside that syllabus that if you were in a real life situation, I said, you know, study for the exam, use the stuff that's on the syllabus 
and use that on the exam. But, you know, if you're going to use it in real life, please come talk to me later and I'll tell you some of the other stuff to go look at because not everything is written down. That's the first thing. Um, but also, I, as I mentioned, there's been a lot of regulatory change. The SOA does try to keep up with all the changes, but it takes time. You know, it takes time things to get written and published that they can put on the syllabus. Um, something I had written for an entirely different purpose ended up on what a little bit of the ERM exam syllabus that was a comparison of RBC versus solvency too. Um, yes, and sir. that's because they didn't have anything. Uh, <laughs> it was just new, uh, with regards to solvency too. Uh, it's not new now, but it, it was new back then and it's hard to find materials that are appropriate, uh, that cover the new things. Most of it are people figuring out in real time, doing presentations at SOA meetings and stuff like that. Uh, not necessarily, you know, a journal article or anything like that. For sure. I, I'm wondering um, that when Selden C2 rolled out, uh, there must have been with all the all the the principles that are uh, implemented within it, it really did take time for industry to, you know, maybe to have some delays similar to IFRS 17 now. Uh, yeah, I was going to say IFRS 17, and then there's the long term uh, duration contracts in the US with US right. GAAP. Um, and yes, it, it does keep get, getting delayed, but we know it's going to be implemented at some point. You, yeah. I mean, and you don't want to be for these kind of complicated changes, you, you can't do it last minute. You have to be building it up along the way. I mean, I'm thinking of also a LIBOR being ended and, you know, some other stuff. It's, it's, Pretty crazy some of the regulatory change that some people leave to the last minute uh, to apply in their own organization. They end up, of course, having to go to consultants and others. Nothing wrong with consultants, obviously, but you really shouldn't have left it <laughs> to the last <laughs> minute of when it's just about to be implemented on you. Um, okay. It right. takes a long time for these changes to get developed. Um, and none of it's secret, you know, there's the NEAC, other regulatory bodies. I know it's all C2. I saw so many different papers of how the SCR uh, formula changed, you know, the standard formula uh, for this. Um, what's SCR stand for again? Cap cap capital requirements. <laughs> yeah, uh, solvency yeah, capital requirement. Capital. I'm just like, yeah, <laughs> I don't remember <laughs> the name of it. But I, we don't have to use solvency C2 in the U.S., obviously. It's, it's, that's why I'm. RBC minded, that's the US. So right. also with the last podcast that you discussed uh with actuarial outposts, I was I was kind of <laughs> I used to live live off of that uh forum yeah, and um RIP. Yeah. yeah, it was last it was last fall. I don't want to get in it it was it was a sad loss. <laughs> uh, you know, people say that about a person dying, which is <laughs> obviously a person's more important than a website. But it was kind of sad because a whole bunch of institutional knowledge essentially went kaput. Um, we are, some of us backed up our own, like I had all these threads going back, but like all of the exam stuff, I don't know if anybody saved that. Uh, that said, the exams do change. Um, there are new communities. I know that the actuary subreddit is pretty active and that is mainly people taking exams as one would expect. Um, there is a new community called Go Actuary that the people who originally founded the actual outpost started last year. They intended to do something else, but this is where a lot of us ended up from the actual outpost who aren't taking exams. Um, but they also have exam uh, forums in there as well. Um, so it takes time to build community. Um, and that's sure. one of the things is like, the Reddit community is a certain way that's very, very focused on the exams. Um, and, and part of it, it has to do with the structure of the different communities and who's involved. Um, so we'll see where those end up. It, it, it was such a loss of a great resource. For sure, yeah. I was, <laughs> I was hoping it was just temporarily uh, knocked down, but it seems permanent. Um, yeah, so we were hoping that it, it, the the website. I, I don't want to be misleading. The website exists, but it's it got totally replaced from start. There was no content in it. A new forum, and basically, um, it's not. I mean, if you're going to start from scratch. Uh, you need to go somewhere where there actually are people being involved. Right. 
and where they're involved is on that subreddit and on uh, Go Actuary. Okay, so subreddit Go Actuary, and um, uh, you also yeah, the subreddit is slash r slash uh, actuary. Um, it's easy to find. <laughs> There's not a lot of actuarial subreddits. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same setup too, pretty much with the uploads and, and things like that. Then you can obviously, you know, converse that uh, reply to people's. Yeah, I mean, and I mean, the, the issue with not the issue, the reason people are on the subreddit is, I mean, they're on Reddit for other communities there as well. Um, that's not strictly actuarial. It. It remind. I mean, I'm so old. Um, it reminds me of the old Usenet groups uh, <laughs> where where we would post this and the other in, you know, alt dot whatever. Um, that we were in, you know, sci dot math and then sci dot math dot moderated and all of that. Um, so yes, okay, kitties. That's what the internet used to be like. Um, <laughs> <laughs> not that different from Reddit, except we didn't have videos and it was even tough to share. Pictures, um, yeah, we still had dial up. <laughs> well, that, that's in, the more things change, the more they stay the same, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because people are trying to build the same kind of thing. We want to interact, we want to share information, ask questions, and, and get answers. Um, and it doesn't matter if it was Usenet or it's Reddit or it's Go Actuary or you know, whatever, or Twitter. I do a lot of actuarial conversing on Twitter this morning. I was I was discussing an SOA mortality report uh, with various people. People are like, oh, Twitter is a trash site. Well, it's like, it's not my fault. You are following trash people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there, there's some good, there's actually some good conversations to be had on Twitter, but you know, it's like, it, it's like a party line. Anyone can throw in and you never know what you're gonna get. Exactly. Yeah, I, I always. Uh, well, someone was saying it's like ice cream. Like it's good for a little bit, but if you have it too much, uh, oh yeah, you don't want to be on it all the time. That's yeah, yeah. yeah that's not good. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other resource that you brought up, uh, actuarial news. Um, yeah, that, I mean that's my website, and that's why I didn't mention it. Okay. Um, it's not a community. Um, so yeah, this is a website. It's it's built on WordPress and. This is this is actually my replacement of actuarial outpost because of what I was using the outpost for. I was using it to save stories about public pensions um, and uh, other things. I'm interested. You'll see in the top with these categories: public pensions, mortality, public finance, and investments. I have other categories as well. So some of the stuff I've been collecting a lot of COVID-related material, but I can put categories and tags. So I'll just go into Puerto Rico. Um, and so I have a link to the original. Um, I always have a link to whatever the original material is and a little excerpt of, of what's going on. And then I have, you know, different tags. If I want to, what are all the things I've, I've kept with Puerto Rico? I used to have a thread at the actual outpost, which was a Puerto Rico debt thread, watch thread, um, because of kind of the bankruptcy that Puerto Rico has been going through. Um, and this has been along with public finance, with public pensions, even mortality. Usually the trends are very, very long term um, and not acute. And you don't have any good repository that it's categorized together. Um, and so that's why I created the site. Um, I keep, you know, my whole, all of my uh, material here. And I use it for my own blogging because I started a sub stack, which all the kids are doing now. Um, so I, I compile a lot of this stuff together. I cover mortality and public pensions and I, the census numbers and public finance and stuff like that. Um, so I've been blogging and actual news is so of like, okay, what's been going on in public finance? Okay. So I have my public finance stories, you know, so videos, um, you know, news items, all sorts of things. Um, yeah, and, and this just kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier with regulatory change. A lot of these take a very long time. Some of the changes going on now, over a decade later, after the financial crisis, took over a decade to develop. Um, this is not a complaint. This is an observation. It takes a long time for a lot of this regulatory change because there's a lot of secondary effects that you have to think through and some of this is so complex you know and this is like you're saying ifrs 17 um 
and, and stuff like that. And I'll just stop sharing. IFRS 17 takes a long time for people to, um, to implement all the details because they didn't set up their systems originally to handle something like that. And the regulators have to think, what reports do we need? Um, you know, how do we interpret this? Now we have more complicated information, more complicated risk analysis now. You know, before we were just thinking, okay, do the New York 7 interest rate, you know, at, you know, rates up, rates down, stocks up, stocks down, whatever. And you're like, that's not enough scenarios because right. we don't know what the stress scenario is going to be for that block of business, if you're a regulator. Um, if you're in the company, you should know what kind of scenarios are going to stress that product. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting thinking through of the asymmetry of the information between the regulators and the companies and stuff like that. And in some right. cases, it's, it's risk we didn't even think about. So you know, think, of the pandem think last year, pandemic. Yeah. Did, you, did anyone <laughs> think we've had pandemics before? But if you go back, not to the Spanish flu, but even if you went back to the Spanish flu, uh, the pandemics did not stress economically. There were major flu pandemics or even think SARS-1. There was some disruption, but like it really didn't affect the financial markets that much. Think about that. Do you think and, it like, was- what uh... the governments had to do in response to the SARS-1, you know? So, um, People weren't expecting, we've always assumed mortality and, you know, economic scenarios weren't correlated. There's, there's a whole bunch of, uh, you know, insurance linked uh, securities that assumes that longevity, I mean, maybe we need to rethink those assumptions. So in the middle of, of the pandemic, how, how uh, have insurers and, and uh, how have they adapted uh, are the premiums just higher for uh, um, policies? I mean, that... Yeah, I'm not, this intersects with my day job, so I can't give away too much for free. Um, yeah. <laughs> actually, um, the there has been a lot of disruption and change in life insurers in the U.S. Um, and I'm sure in Canada as well, because a lot of the stuff that we had been used to doing face to face, even sales were still kind of face to face um, for a lot of life insurance products. Partly because people don't like thinking about mortality and dealing with it. So it's, it's kind of hard. Like, so for certain tran financial transactions, people will do it online very easily. But thinking about your own death and how much you have to buy and stuff like that, there have been a few like Haven Life who have made that digital, um, digital only distribution switch. Or, I mean, that's what they were created for by Mass Mutual. <laughs> But, um, you know, a lot of people really don't want to go out of their way and think about it. And then all of a sudden it's in your face and you cannot escape the concept of this mortality risk in your life. And there has been a lot of interest on the consumer side, at least for just the pure uh, mortality protection kind of thing. And now maybe people are also thinking about long-term care and other aspects that disability that they weren't thinking about before. We'll see. Um, but insurers did have to scramble a lot. They, a lot of them had been making a transition, at least with the back office, but distribution of sales stuff. Um, yeah, there was a lot of, there was a lot of scrambling and some insurers actually stopped selling policies during the, yeah. That was kind of interesting because during the Spanish flu, some insurers were still selling, even though they didn't know about that. I mean, they had telegraphs, they could tell people to stop selling, but they would sell. And then the next day the person would be dead um, and they would actually pay out. Uh, um, no, no life insurance company went insolvent because of uh, wow. Spanish yeah, um, so that was kind of interesting. Uh, the history there is very, very interesting. So as you can tell, I like taking a very, very long-term point of view. Um, longevity and mortality issues usually, I mean, I, I love looking at mortality trends. They usually are very slow moving over a long period of time. We just saw a shock, you know, in the risk last year. Um, and that does happen from time to time. Will we be getting more of this? Maybe not COVID, maybe something else. 
So right. this is something insurers have to think about. It's something individuals have to think about. And insurers, I don't want to say they want to think about it, but they have to. And individuals probably don't want to think about it, but they should. So definitely look forward to listening more on uh, mortality with me, but on yeah. the latest and greatest. <laughs> I love doing that. Uh, yeah, people know life's like um, I had an alumni uh, online Zoom meeting last year and they're going like don't ask me what i'm up to because i will show you <laughs> <laughs> and i'm like oh yeah i've been looking at the the excess mortality and i was showing them graphs and they're just like this is not what we asked for <laughs> you wanted like your cats you know people's pets and and kids and stuff not talking mortality oh well that's what you yeah, get well, an actuary that... around so. It's, yeah, well, it's the only thing guaranteed plus taxes, right? So, uh, well, so here's the thing death comes only once, so that's a good thing. Taxes <laughs> that comes at least annually, if not more frequently. So, that's you know. true, yeah. Uh, not an non annual, <laughs> right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, I had been thinking about, um, you know, the SOA does an actual speculative fiction contest. And long time ago, I thought Night of the Living Death uh, benefits and um, as a zombie, the actual zombie story <laughs> where <laughs> someone collects, on, you know, someone dies, they collect on the life insurance policy, they come back as a zombie. Well, what do you do then? Um, so it's like, well, you have to pay it back. No, no, no. But I did actually die, you know. <laughs> well, it'd have to be written in the contract. You can't come back a zombie or it'll be exempt. Yeah, and it's not in there. So the policy forms are just really not keeping up with that zombie risk. They need to think about that. <laughs> I'll be looking for uh, that that next risk to come out in the new exam for zombie risk. Yeah, so. <laughs> and, uh, well, and it, it, it beats dinosaurs eating actuaries. So uh, that's why I, I'm trying to remember which exam. They always had that dinosaur eating actuaries at a Poisson rate. Um, I don't know if they ask that question anymore. That one I always liked. Uh, anyway. <laughs> it's a constant rate, uh, relatively, right? That's why it's Yeah, possible. it was a, a homogeneous Poisson process. Uh, <laughs>